In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Loving Heavenly Father, we praise you, we thank you for another beautiful day you have given each one of us. Thank you, Father, for your loving presence with each one of us. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for caring for us. Thank you for watching over us. And most of all, Lord God, on this journey of life, promising us, and being faithful to that promise, never to leave us, never to forsake us. Today, as we gather together as one family, we thank you for the opportunity to fellowship with the Holy Spirit and to fellowship with one another. Spirit of God, as you teach us this morning, help us, Lord, to understand the word. Make this teaching of Holy Spirit absolutely easy. Anoint my heart, my lips, my tongue, my vocal cords, my entire being. As I speak the word, nothing of me, everything of you. And Lord, let this word that you teach us each day be so practical for us to apply in our everyday life, every single moment of our life, so that as we do the word and not just hear the word, we can live the victorious life that Jesus has already obtained for us. We thank you and we praise you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. So once again, a warm welcome to you, my sisters and brothers. Today's gospel is from Luke chapter 6, verses 27 to 38. We have already begun with Luke's gospel, chapter 6. And in this gospel, especially in the passage that we are going to read today, we are going to see the characteristics or how life is of a believer in the kingdom of God. If Jesus has appointed us, if Jesus has chosen us, the word of God says in Christ Jesus, we were chosen by the Lord, by the Father, even before the foundations of the earth. That is what it says in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3. The Father in Christ Jesus has chosen each one of us, not when we were born, not when we were in our mother's womb, but before the foundations of the earth. That means every single person, the father in his, in his omnipotence, in his, in his foreknowledge, knew who would belong to his son Jesus and who would be saved. And you know, brothers and sisters, today as we read the gospel, put yourself in every single verse of today's gospel, because this is the life that you and I are supposed to live when we belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. When we belong to the kingdom of God, when we belong to the Father, when we are children of the Heavenly Father, the life that we are called to live is the life that is described in these verses, right from verses 27 to 38. So let's begin with verse number 27 and 28 together. But I say to you that listen, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. Now here in the statement, Jesus is applying only to those who obey God's word by hearing it. In other words, Jesus links the obedience of good works to the hearing of the word of God. Can you imagine, brothers and sisters, many of us want to do a lot of good work in the kingdom of God. Many of us want to do a lot of projects. Many of us want to do charity. Many of us want to build buildings. Many of us want to do something so that we can truly be a blessing to others. But the question is, are we doing it because we have heard the Lord speak to us? Are we doing it because the Holy Spirit is leading us? Are we doing it because it is God's will for you and me to do what we are doing? Or is it because I want to feel some self-satisfaction? I want to feel good because of what I'm doing for somebody else. And brothers and sisters, the moment I'm doing it to feel good, even though I'm doing such good work, that work is supposed to be, according to the Bible, dead works. So anything that we are doing without the guidance of the Holy Spirit, without the Lord leading us to do, is absolutely dead works. Can you imagine David wanted to build a temple for the Lord? He had made all the preparation. He had cut the wood. He had got the, the 
jewels and all the gold and everything ready. He had got the craftsmen ready and he was ready to start building a temple to the Lord. But what happens? As soon as he has this desire to build the temple, he tells the prophet and the prophet tells him, do what you want to do. But what happens? That night, the Lord spoke to the prophet and told the prophet, David is not the man who's going to build the temple even though it was something good, but it is his son Solomon who's going to build the temple. And immediately David, although he's going to do something good, stops building the temple and he allows his son after his death to build that temple for the Lord. Brothers and sisters, please understand, if you and I are called to do anything in the Lord's kingdom, we need to consult the Lord. We need to ask the Holy Spirit to give us a confirmation. If there is something that I want to do because I want to have pleasure for myself, I want to run away from one problem so that I will have peace of mind. Let me tell you one thing. That is not coming from the Lord. What the word of God says is going to direct you to your future. What the word of God is says is going to direct you to your destiny. What the word of God says is going to lead you to victory in spite of every hassle, every problem, every cross that you are experiencing right now. And therefore, what is required of us is not to be just hearers of the word. People like to hear the word of God and, and we love to come to hear the word of God and we even will say the preacher is so good, the sermon was wonderful. But the question today is, the Lord is not looking only for hearers. He is looking for those who are doers of the word. Remember, brothers and sisters, even St. James says, don't just be a hearer of the word. Be a doer. And to be a doer of the word confirms that you really love the Lord. When a person doesn't love the Lord, just hears the word, that person is far. The Lord says, I don't even know you. I'm going to spit you out of my mouth because you're lukewarm. You're only, only hearing the word and you're only doing nothing about what the word tells you to do. Brothers and sisters, if we understand that when we become doers of the word, we are proving to Jesus that we truly love him. And you know, brothers and sisters, in the Old Testament, the response of what the statement says in verse 27 and 28 was exactly the opposite. What does the word of God say in the Old Testament? Let us read Exodus chapter 21, verse 24. Exodus chapter 21, verse 24. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. Everything that the word of God says in, Ex in Exodus chapter 21, verse 24, literally says, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, hand for a hand, leg for a leg, everything that you have damaged of somebody, that particular part of your body is going to be damaged. That's what the law said. And you know, brothers and sisters, the world today, the world today without Christ actually advocates the same thing as in the Old Testament. Because in the Old Testament, the law simply helped man to limit sin so that the law could prevent people from doing as they liked and go and commit murder, commit theft, commit every sin of adultery, commit every, every sin that is on the earth, face of the earth. But the law was not able to enable people to have any relationship with God. Remember my brothers and sisters, the rules and regulations do not help us to develop a relationship with God. It is only by believing in what Jesus has done for us on the cross. So today's world without Christ, what does it say? You scratch my back, I'll scratch your back. That's what it says. Now, if you read the, the, the word uh, which it says abuse you, the word abuse you, which is used in today's gospel in verse number 27 and 28, comes from the Greek word epirezo. Epirezo, which simply means to slander or to insult. The word abuse comes from the Greek word epirezo, which simply means to slander or to insult. So in effect, Jesus is saying, you must invoke blessings and pray for the happiness of those who curse you and implore God's favor upon those who do you, ins who insult you and abuse you. My brothers and sisters, I want to ask each one of us, including myself, this question. If the word of God says that we are supposed to pray for those who abuse you, we are supposed to bless those who curse you, 
are we the people who are going to bless those who curse us? And are we going to invoke God's blessing upon those who do us harm? Or are we in turn going to do it? exactly like those Old Testament people and like the people of the world today without Christ that I'm going to curse somebody because they cursed me and I'm going to give them a, a real lesson for what they have done to me in my life for all the harm that they have done. And if that is our response, brothers and sisters, we need to seriously reflect. We need to repent what we are heading for, where we are heading for. Because let me say this, no one will ever be able to have any suffering in this world, which is beyond their ability to endure. God will not allow you to suffer in this world beyond your ability to endure because Jesus himself became man. He, the creator, became just like you and me and walked on this earth. And he showed us by his own example right to the cross how we could live the way you and I are called to live. Brothers and sisters, it is only through the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit, which has been given to us at our new birth, that enables us to love, to forgive, to bless, and even to invoke blessings upon those who curse us and do all sorts of harm to us. Let me say this again. Unless we have received the new birth, and how do we receive the new birth? 2 Corinthians chapter one, uh, chapter 5, verse 17 says that if anyone is in Christ, listen to this very carefully. We have heard this in previous classes, but I want to stress on this one more time. If anyone is in Christ Jesus, he is a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. Now, many a times we experience, even after we have accepted Christ, we experience trials, we experience difficulties, we experience crosses, we experience persecution, we experience people coming against us. And then we begin to wonder, what is Christianity all about? I came to Christ so that my life would be joyful, my life would be blessed, I would experience a wonderful life here on earth. And look at my crosses, look at the problems. They have just grown, they have increased. And what sort of Christianity is this? And I want to tell you, my sisters and brothers, we saw yesterday that the sufferings that we are suffering in this life right now are nothing compared to the glory that shall be revealed on the day of Jesus Christ. And therefore, it is only through the presence of the Holy Spirit in us, which we received at our new birth, when we became a new creation in Christ, when our spirit became the same as the spirit of Jesus Christ and our spirits were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. That's what St. Paul writes to the Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13. Let us read that. When we received the good news of our salvation, the Holy Spirit sealed our spirit with the Holy Spirit. And when the, our spirit has been sealed with the Holy Spirit, God says, I will never leave you, never forsake you. I'm there with you. I'm in you. I'm going to stay with you. It is for you to change your mind and believe that I'm in you. And now you're going to receive all that strength to even love the one who is your enemy. The one who's going to curse you. The one who's going to come against you. The one who's going to do all sorts of harm to you. But if you cannot believe that the spirit of God is inside of you, you don't believe that Christ is living inside of you. My brothers and sisters, we will reject that Christ was in us and we will use our own wisdom. We will begin to let the situation and circumstances overrule us. And we now will be living the most miserable life, a life where Satan will actually dominate and control our life. Let us read Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, to understand the power that is within us. In him, you also, when you had heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation and had believed in him were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. So you were marked with the seal of the Holy Spirit of promise. Brothers and sisters, the day we received Christ, we received the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit does not come and go. We don't need to ask the Holy Spirit to come. Whenever we say, come Holy Spirit, we are actually telling him, you're not inside of me. You're gone away and I need to call you to come inside of me. When you believe the Holy Spirit is with you to stay with you till the end of your life, 
You will never ever say, come Holy Spirit. You will never ever say, Holy Spirit, come now, anoint me, bless me, come Holy Spirit, as though he has ever left you. When did the Holy Spirit leave you? When the day you received Christ, he said, I'm with you, I'm in you, I'm, I'm going to stay with you, and I'm never going to leave you. So the, we must remember this truth, brothers and sisters. And now listen to this very carefully. The love of God has been poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. The love of God has been poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. What sort of love? Agape love. One-sided love. The God kind of love, the unconditional love. Do what you want. I am going to still love you. This is the love that God has poured inside of us. And when did he pour that love into us? When we received the new birth. That's what it says when St. Paul writes to the Romans in Romans chapter 5, verse 5. Let us read that. And hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. The love of God has been poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. Now remember my brothers and sisters, without the Holy Spirit, we just can never love anybody. We cannot even love even the people who love us because every time we are going to love somebody, we are always going to calculate in our mind by doing good to somebody, what good am I going to get in return? What is the use of loving somebody if that person is not going to love me? If God had to think this way, my brothers and sisters, every single person, including myself, would have been disqualified. God loves us even though we are not lovable. The word of God says, even though we were sinners, God sent his only son into this world, even though we were sinners, we were his enemies. And how much more now when we belong to his son, Jesus, and how much we do we belong to him when we have the Holy Spirit of promise within us? So brothers and sisters, if the Holy Spirit is within us, the love of God has been poured within us. And now only through that love of God, which has been poured into us, we will be able to love others, including our enemies. You know, brothers and sisters, it is impossible I'm not saying it is difficult. It is impossible to obey God's word without the Holy Spirit. You know why? Because if we do not have the Holy Spirit with us, if we have not truly received the new body, we have really not been born again. You know, what is our life going to be? I remember when I was a little boy at our home, there used to be a grandfather's clock. And, on, and for that grandfather's clock, just below there, where, where the time used to be shown, there used to be a pendulum that used to sing, swing between left to right, left to right, left to right. And you know what? A person who does not have the Holy Spirit, is, his life is exactly like that pendulum. Why? Because that pendulum swings left and right. It's never steady. It goes one side left, one side right, and it is continuously swinging from left to right. And that's exactly the life of, an, of a person who does not have the Holy Spirit, who's not really born again. They are dominated by their feelings. They are dominated by their moods. They are dominated by their emotions. They are dominated by their circumstances. And our brothers and sisters, if we are living a life like that, where the word of God does not control our life, where the word of God is not our final authority, but every single word, every situation, our mood, our hormones, I don't know what is going on within our body or whatever. If that is going to decide how we are going to behave and how, how we are going to love others, then surely our life is the most miserable life. Let me say this again. Our life as Christians, as believers of the Lord Jesus Christ is not to be controlled by external situations. It is not even supposed to be controlled by our moods, by our hormones and by whatever is happening in our life or what others do to us. Our life should be dominated and controlled by that living word of God and the word and the spirit are one. That's what Jesus says in John 6, 63. He says, my word is spirit. My word is life. And if you and I, brothers and sisters, can live our life according to God's word, no matter what somebody is doing to me, I don't care how much I've been insulted, how much I've been cursed, how much I've been abused. I only know one thing, that this love that God has poured into me, 
that love is giving me the strength to even love my enemy. It's giving me the strength even to bless and pray and seek the happiness of the person who's trying to make my life miserable. And as we go further down, we shall see why Jesus says that. Why Jesus says that even though you have got people abusing you, people persecuting you, you still need to bless them, you need to pray for them, you need to love them because there is a purpose in which God is going to use you and me in order to bring that person into the kingdom of God. Verse number 29. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Now, we think that Jesus has given us this particular command and many think that Jesus has asked this to show the other cheek is because either Jesus loves his children being abused and assaulted or he is absolutely insensitive. He doesn't care whether you are suffering or you are in pain. And many times, brothers and sisters, because of this wrong thinking, we have assumed wrong and we find that in spite of the persecutions and sufferings, we are unable to make an impact in the kingdom of God. Let me say one more time. When we understand that in the midst of our persecution and suffering, God is going to turn that situation around as long as we don't quit. As long as we hold on to his word, as long as we hold on to his promise, because in the midst of this persecution, in the midst of all that you're facing, God has a beautiful plan. God actually wants us to, God will never give us anything beyond our ability to endure. That's what the word of God says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 13. Let us read that. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 13. No testing has overtaken you that it is not common to everyone. God is faithful and he will not let you be tested beyond your strength. But with the testing, he will also provide the way out so that you may be able to endure it. Wow, absolutely an awesome promise. You know, brothers and sisters, the Holy Spirit talking through St. Paul says, that when you and I go through that suffering, go through that cross, go through that persecution, God is going to provide us that grace because he says no single person on this planet earth has ever been given any suffering which is beyond their ability to endure. And as we begin to endure the cross and endure that suffering, God says he's going to find a way out so that now through that cross, there's going to be something beautiful that's going to be erupted or that's going to happen happen because of your suffering. Remember, brothers and sisters, at the end of Good Friday, after three days, there was an Easter Sunday. If you are going through your Good Friday right now, if you're going to the cross right now, if you find that the pressure on yourself is so much that you are decided to quit, if you have decided without even going to the word of God, if you have made the decision to quit and go, you have told the Lord, you are just not good enough, Lord. I do not trust you anymore. All that you have been telling me to do, I do not believe because I don't trust your word. I don't believe your word. I want to live my life according to my standard. And my standard is going to be the final standard. If you think, brothers and sisters, that you can do it your way, the Lord will not stop you. But let me tell you one thing. Whenever you step out, not doing what the word says, doing what you want to say, because you think that you will find peace, you are just stepping into something more disastrous because that you will reach into a point where even coming back, even for you to return, will be absolutely impossible. And you know, brothers and sisters, in the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, verse 4, the, Hebrew, the writer of Hebrews also talks about the same thing. He's talking about our ability to endure. He's talking about that persecution that we have gone through, that even we may never have had to shed our blood because of the sin that we have committed. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. In your ability or in your attempt to, you know, counter sin, 
you have not gone to the point of shedding your blood. Can you imagine, brothers and sisters, Jesus had to struggle with sin because he was made the sin of the whole world. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 says, because Jesus was made sin for the whole world because he was righteous, he was holy, now he had to endure the cross. He had to go to the cross and to the point where he had to shed his own blood. Brothers and sisters, you and I do not need to shed our blood. Our blood is not precious that we need to shed it even for our own salvation or for the salvation of anybody else. For the simple reason, we are belonging to the fallen race. The only way you and I can become righteous is by putting our faith in that Savior, Jesus Christ. When we understand his blood has washed us clean, his blood has cleansed us. So now by believing in what Jesus has done, we become the righteousness of God. So what is the purpose of enduring sufferings and persecution, brothers and sisters, and even physical assault for the sake of Jesus Christ? What is the purpose of all this? Why does Jesus want to do this for us? Why does God wants us, want us to put all this, go, us to go through all this pain? It is for this reason, brothers and sisters. Let me explain to you. If you got a pen and paper, I want you to note this down and write it on your heart, write it on your walls, write it in your piece of paper in capital block letters and never forget this. This is the truth that you're going to receive, which is going to help you every single moment of your life. When the enemy comes to you with thoughts of quitting, when the enemy comes to you with thoughts to give the, to just quit and go and live your life the way you want to go, let me tell you, this is the time. These two points are going to help you to understand that not everything is lost. There is a purpose for your suffering. There is a purpose for you, for your enduring. You don't have to go and die on the cross. You will never be persecuted when you will be hung like Jesus on the cross. But you will go for persecution. You will face persecution. You will face rejection. Because when we show the other cheek, Listen to this, my dear sisters and brothers. If you've got a pen and paper, write this down. When you show the other cheek, two things happen. And if you can write it down, I, I want to insist on you writing it down. That's why I'm just wanting, if you've got your pen and paper, while I delay for you to write this, get your pen and paper. There are two reasons when, when you show the other cheek. First reason, first thing that happens is, God gets involved into your battle. When you show the other cheek, God gets involved in your battle. When we choose to do it God's way of showing the other cheek and not settling and not you know, trying to settle the hurt by ourselves, by our own carnal thinking, we are not going to follow the Old Testament, tooth for a tooth, eye for an eye. So the first thing that you want to do is you want to transfer this battle to the Lord. And if you want to do it according to God's way, you want God to fight your battle. You want to have victory. Do it God's way. Don't do it your way. Because our flesh will scream. Our mind will say, listen, if somebody has been doing been so nasty to me for so long, enough is enough. I have to put them into, into their places. I want to give them a piece of my mind. And you know, brothers and sisters, most of the time when we want to give somebody a piece of their mind, we end up coming from there in pieces. Let me tell you one thing. In order for God to fight your battle and my battle, we need to do it God's way. And therefore, when somebody strikes me on one cheek, I need to show the other cheek. Because the moment I make that decision to show the other cheek, I have just got the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings to fight my battle. Now I can tell you one thing. You and I cannot fight our battle the way the creator will fight our battle. Because when the creator fights, that victory is assured. It's not going to be a 50-50. It's not going to be 90-10. When the Lord gets into our battle, victory is assured. Point number two, the person who offended us with one strike will be won over to Christ because we have been offering the other cheek. Why? Because he will want to seek what you and I have got, which he doesn't have. And what is that that you and I have that gives us the strength to offer the other cheek? 
Let me tell you, my brothers and sisters, with our own willpower, we will never ever win this battle. It is the Holy Spirit in us that gives us the strength to always offer the other cheek. Because when we offer the other cheek, what happens? The person who has offered us the first shot, when he gets ready to fight, to lift his hand to do the second shot on the other cheek which you're offering, God gets into the battle. And the most important thing is that person is won over to Christ because he, he wants to have what you have. He wants to have what you have inside of you, my brothers and sisters. And that is that you are not going to hit back. You're not going to give us, you're not going to scratch somebody's back. You don't want to use Old Testament law, tooth for a tooth, eye for an eye. But on the contrary, you want to bring that person to the Lord. And you know, brothers and sisters, when we do it God's way, we will be able to bring the most hardened heart into the kingdom of God. I want to repeat this again. When we do it God's way, by offering the other cheek, by letting God get into our battle, we can bring the most sinful person, the most hardened heart into the kingdom of God. And if you and I have been chosen by the Lord to save one soul, one soul in the kingdom, because you're going to die to self, you're going to offer the other cheek, so be it, my brothers and sisters. Imagine the responsibility. Imagine how much God is trusting you right now for what you have and what he has put into your life and the persecution and the suffering that you're going through because he wants you to be used. He wants to use you to save that soul which is shouting out, which is persecuting you, which is troubling you because it's tormenting you. But when you know you have Christ, you have the Lord of Lords with you, he has promised you that you will have the strength to endure every cross that you're going through. He will, you will have the strength, you will have the grace, you'll have his power in order to face every persecution that is coming your way. And brothers and sisters, it is not only by preaching God's word. It's not only by teaching God's word. We can talk the word. We can speak the scriptures. We can use the word of God. We can even quote the best preacher in the world. But when we live our life doing the word, which God, Jesus says, can you imagine what victory we can bring into the kingdom of God? The most hardened heart can be brought into the kingdom of God. What happened to Saul? Saul was a self-righteous man. He was a man who was trained by Gamaliel. He thought he was the righteous man and he was persecuting all the Christians. But the day he encountered Christ, when Jesus said to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Remember my brothers and sisters, if someone is persecuting you, he is persecuting Christ. When you understand God takes your persecution personally, if you're going through a cross right now, you're going through a hard, difficult marriage, you're going through some horrible relationship, you're going through some financial problems, you're going through some health problems, you're going through some relational problems. I want to give you some good news today. God is aware of what you're going through. He knows you're suffering right now. He is not silent. But if you're going through that persecution, trusting his and depending on his word, I can assure you, victory is round the corner. Victory is round the corner, my brothers and sisters. Evangelization is more effective, brothers and sisters, when we live the word of God. And it's not only by preaching and teaching the word of God. Jesus showed us by his own example. Jesus could have preached, he could have said, you know, you should love your enemies. You should do good to those who hate you. You should forgive. And what did he do when he went to the cross? Brothers and sisters, Jesus did not only preach and taught, he actually showed us with his own example. And if you and I, who are belonging to the Lord Jesus Christ, have been given an opportunity right now, beginning in our own homes, in our own families, in our own marriages, if we can take the word of God, instead of allowing that situation to become so huge by glorifying it, speaking about it, let's go and show some love. Let's show some unconditional love. For every hurt, let it be a game that I'm going to play every morning. For every hurt that I receive, I'm going to return that, that hurt with love. And let's see who's going to win this game. Brothers and sisters, when we begin to operate in agape love, 
for every hurt that is done, I'm going to respond to that with love, with unconditional love. So I'm ignorant. I'm absolutely oblivious to what has been done to me, what harm has been done to me. And when I respond to every hurt, for every word, and for everything that has been done to against me, I respond to that with love. I tell you, brothers and sisters, God is in your battle. God is in my battle. And that victory is assured. God is going to bring you to a, to a higher level in his relationship with him. And he's also going to bring the person who's persecuting you into the kingdom and make him so strong or make her so strong that this very person tomorrow is going to be used to bring so many other souls into the kingdom. If you can understand, brothers and sisters, right now, whatever be your situation, if you can just hold on to the word of God, you don't make any decision to quit, but say, Lord, if you have given me this situation, if this is what I am in right now, maybe it's not the Lord who's given you. It's exactly what we did. We may have sown the seeds, the wrong seeds in our life. And what we are experiencing right now is the harvest of all that we have sown. But praise God that today when we know the truth of God's word, Every seed of unbelief, every seed of, seed of persecution, of pain, of misery can be cut off. That harvest can be cut off and the new harvest of God's love, God's grace, God's mercy, God's abundance can be sown in your life and in my life. Verse number 31. Verse number 30. Give to everyone who begs from you. And if anyone takes away your goods, do not ask for them again. So this verse says, give to everyone who begs of you. Can you imagine, brothers and sisters, somebody coming and begging you? Many a times, you know, when we are here who are in India, if you're going in the streets of, you know, the metro, me metros like in Mumbai or in Madras or, you know, uh, here also in Goa, if you go on the streets, if you're, if you're at the parking lot or probably you are on, at, a, at, a, at a signal, you will find so many youngsters or people stretching out their hand begging. And you know, brothers and sisters, what does it mean to beg? To beg simply means that person has lost all shame or he is not proud to ask of you. There are two things a person does, a two mindsets of a person who begs. A person who begs has lost all shame. Why? Because that person says, anyway, I have nothing with me, so might as well beg and get something from somebody to fill my stomach. Another person could be begging because they have lost their pride. I mean, they don't have any pride. They have just, you know, they just say, I mean, what is the big deal about it? Uh, who, who cares? Let me just beg and let me fill my stomach. And you know, brothers and sisters, when we reflect on this as believers, we are called to share and show compassion. Listen to this very carefully. As believers of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are always called to share and show compassion. But we must understand as believers, we don't do it like the people of this world. Most of the time, people of this world without Christ, when they go out and see a beggar, they will put their hand in their pocket and they'll give something because they want to feel good. They feel sympathy. They feel pity. They want to do something. They feel good that somebody is going to be blessed. And you hear so many stories like that. But as believers of the Lord Jesus Christ, we must discern if the person begging is doing so to become a sucker or just needs that to you know give him some boost or give him just you know a little bit of a charge now what i'm what am i saying say for example you have parked your car your parking lot and you've gone on vacation for a month or two when you come back and you try to start your car your car is not going to start because obviously the battery is down so you will ask your neighbor or ask a friend to come with their car. They will put their jumper and with their jumper, they'll give the charge from their battery to your battery so that your battery will start. And now, as soon as your car starts, you will go to the nearest garage and you will either change your battery or put some water or put some acid or you'll get the car fixed or so something you will do. In the same way, my brothers and sisters, it is very important for us as believers of the Lord Jesus Christ when we are going to do something for somebody else, it is important for us to discern before we step, stretch out or before we step out to do something good. Because when we do something good, we must teach that person not to depend on us. Listen to this. 
God does not want anybody to depend on man, but he wants us to depend on him. And therefore, brothers and sisters, when we go and step out trying to do something good for somebody, it is important for us before we do anything or before we sow in somebody's life, we need to give that person the truth of God's word. We shall see as we go further in this gospel how we will do that. But it is important for us, not just when we see the every like for example, if you're going to start operating just because somebody is begging to you, put your hand in your pocket and take whatever you have got and give it to that person. Remember, that person's life is not going to change. They are going to beg. They will beg the next day. They will beg the third day. They will beg the fourth day. They will beg the whole month because they know somebody will be passing on that roadside to beg and give them. But when you and I, as believers of the Lord Jesus Christ, need to go and help somebody in compassion, need to help somebody by giving them a charge for their battery, which is down, what do we need to do? We need to teach them the word. We need to show them the principles of the God's kingdom. We need to show them biblical principles so that they will not depend on human beings, but they will depend on the Lord, that you will not become their source of blessing, but it is the Lord who becomes their source of blessing. Brothers and sisters, it is important for us as believers of the Lord Jesus Christ to discern in our giving. Let me say this one more time. As believers of the Lord Jesus Christ, we must discern in our giving. Don't give to feel good because if you are giving to feel good, you're not going to be blessed. We don't give to feel good. We give so that God will be glorified and the person whom you're giving will be blessed and will know the Lord who is the source of every good thing. Verse number 31. Do to others as you would have them do to you. What is Jesus saying here? He is actually talking about Matthew chapter 7 verse 12. What did Jesus say in Matthew 7 verse 12? He said, do to others what you want others to do to you. That is the law and the prophets. That's what he says. Let's read Matthew 7 verse 12. In everything, do to others as you would have them do to you. For this is the law and the prophets. This is the law and the prophets, brothers and sisters. Whenever we want somebody to do something good for us, it is important for us also to do good to others. You know, many a times we want others to come to our rescue. We want others to come and show compassion to us. We want others to be kind to us. We need to go to the mirror and ask ourselves, am I being kind to others? Am I being what others, you want others to be to me? And this word with Jesus talks in verse 31 actually sums up the law and the principle in God's kingdom. As you sow, so shall you reap. Brothers and sisters, whatever we want others to do unto us, we also should do to others. And even those who don't know Christ, also do the same thing. They, they are always good to people who are good to them. It's no big deal. But when we belong to Christ, we must also understand that we are not only called to do good to those who do good to us. We are called to go beyond that and even love our enemies. Verse number 32. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. You know, brothers and sisters, verse number 32 highlights the main difference between human love and agape love or human love and God kind of love. Verse number 32 is talking about how a person can be distinguished when he is a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. If someone belongs to the Lord Jesus, because he has the Holy Spirit in him, he has to be able to display agape love. And agape love is what? As we mentioned, or as I mentioned earlier, it is a God kind of love. It is a one-sided love. It doesn't bother what the other person does because other person's behavior is not going to rule me. I am not going to be controlled by somebody else's behavior, but I'm going to be controlled by the word of God. I'm going to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. I am going to share what the Lord has poured into me. And you know, brothers and sisters, there is a way believers always connect to the Lord. And how do they connect to the Lord? One of the ways to the connect to the Lord is through prayer. 
Surely we all pray. We pray the scriptures. But there is another prayer which is much higher than prayer is by praying in the spirit. But that's what is called as praying in tongues. And we have gone through that in a previous class, how we pray in tongues. But you must understand, brothers and sisters, without God kind of love, praying in tongues is absolutely useless. Why? Because if you are not praying with God kind of love, you're only praying in tongues. You're saying, you're praying in tongues but you're not really experiencing God kind of love. You know what you're doing? You're only making noise. You know, brothers and sisters, people who pray in tongues without experiencing agape love, without the spirit of God, without the God kind of love, they can pray in tongues because you can open your mouth and make all sorts of noises. But if it is not coming out of love, we are only making noise. The motive behind our action determines if these actions are anointed by the Holy Spirit or they are simply dead works. Can you imagine somebody praying in tongues is doing dead works because they are not praying with the love of God. We are not praying with the anointing of the Holy Spirit. That's what it says. The Hebrews writer says in Hebrews chapter 9 verse 14. He says we should avoid the dead works because Jesus through his precious blood has obtained for us a salvation. He has done everything for us. You and I cannot do anything in order to have a relationship with God. The only thing we can do is we can believe what Jesus has already done for us. We can only believe what he has finished for us on the cross. And brothers and sisters, you can pray in tongues. You can pray so much of, you know, do a lot of prayers. You can do million rosaries. You can do million Hail Marys. But if you have no love of God, if the love of God and the Holy Spirit is not, you know, motivating you, the Holy Spirit is not, in, in fact, the one who is the motivator for you to, do any, to open your mouth and pray. If your Holy Spirit is not giving you that love for the Father and for the people around you, it all amounts to dead works. Let's read Hebrews chapter 9 verse 14. How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit, offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to worship the living God? So brothers and sisters, God loves those who don't love him also. Can you imagine if God only loved the people who loved him, then he would not have been God. And God loves even those who do not love him. And we who are recipients of God's love, are we recipients of God's love? Surely, when we receive the Holy Spirit, when we receive Christ, the love of God was poured into our hearts. That's what it says in 1 John chapter 4, verse 10. Let us read that. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. So God has poured his love into us. And now, brothers and sisters, you and I who have received God's love, we are called to pour that love into others. That's what again it says in the next verse, 1 John 4 verse 11. Let us read that. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. Brothers and sisters, because God has loved us, were we lovable? Were we, were we deserving to receive God's love? Absolutely not. Even though we were sinners, even though we had disqualified ourselves, God still loved us. And now because we have received that God kind of love, because we have received the agape love, we are also called to love others and how much more, including our own enemies. Verse number 33. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. You know, my brothers and sisters, in this world, there are so many people who do not know Christ. Many people. Not all, everybody knows Christ. Not everybody is a Christian. There are people of different other faiths, different other religions. There are people who don't even believe in God. But even people who do not know Christ, they treat people well who treat them also well. So supposing you don't know Christ and you treat somebody who doesn't know God, or doesn't know Christ, you treat him well, he will treat you well in return. But what is the difference between a true Christian and a person who doesn't know Christ? The difference of a true Christian is 
we should love those who do wrong to us as Jesus himself did. Can you imagine? We are called as Christians, whom we call ourselves Christian, to love those who do wrong to us. And how can we take that motive? Example from whom can we take the best example? We can take the best example from Jesus himself in Luke chapter 23, verse 24. He's hanging there on the cross. He's in pain. He's in agony. He's suffering. And yet Jesus opens his mouth. Let us read that. Luke 23, verse 24. So Pilate gave his verdict that their demand should be granted. Luke 23, verse 24. Okay, uh, brothers and sisters, Jesus talked about, was it 24, verse 23, just see? Brothers and sisters, on the cross, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I got this verse wrong. I don't, I, we'll, we'll just check on that verse. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Do you think, my brothers and sisters, Jesus did not know what they were doing? He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Why did he say that? Surely they knew what they were doing, but what they did not know was that the whole, that the devil had inspired them to do all that harm to the son of God. And by doing that, the devil was only disqualifying himself. The devil was losing his battle because the only way somebody can physically assault somebody or somebody can do any harm to somebody is only because of sin. And Jesus was the sinless son of God for the devil who ruled the earth before Jesus went to the cross. It was illegal for him to touch the son of God. And when he did that, that particular assault which he did on Jesus disqualified him. He lost his authority on the earth and Jesus snatched the authority from the devil and gave it back to man. And today, brothers and sisters, you, what authority Adam had on this earth before the fall, that same authority is not what you and I have. Jesus has not fully come back and given us the authority on the earth. He has given us authority in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. Thank you, Brother Sandeep. It's Luke chapter 23, verse 34. Let us read that. Luke chapter 23, verse 34. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You know, my brothers and sisters, preaching and teaching the word of God, or preaching and teaching agape love and forgiveness, is, the, is actually the same side of the same coin. Because if you are forgiving somebody and you are loving somebody, you will always do that because you love that person. A person says, I love somebody, but I can't forgive that person. It's, it, 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 it doesn't go right. There's something wrong. When you love somebody, you will also forgive that person. When you forgive somebody, you will also love that person, but you won't do it with your own strength because on our human strength, it is impossible to forgive. It is impossible to, for us to love our enemy. And we receive the God kind of love. When we receive that love that is ready to love us and forgive us, even when we don't deserve it, then only we can offer that love and forgiveness to somebody who doesn't deserve it because we have received it from the creator ourselves. And you know, brothers and sisters, loving somebody and forgiving somebody is actually the same thing. It is the same side of the same coin. And it is okay to preach it. It's okay to teach it. But practically living it out is the key and the most important thing. Because you know what? I can speak to you about agape love. I can speak to you about forgiveness. I can have so many topics about forgiveness and, and loving people with agape love. But when it actually comes to living it in our day-to-day -day life, when somebody strikes me on one cheek, how am I going to respond to that person? Am I just going to hold it back? Am I just going to allow the devil to beat me up? Am I going to allow the devil to, you know, destroy my ministry and destroy all the work that he wants me to do? Or am I going to get that hurt out? Am I going to get that unforgiveness out of my system? Am I going to start loving that person in spite of his being not a person who is lovable? Now, brothers and sisters, God can continue to use us for his glory. Remember, when we begin to do what God's word says, this is the time we begin to experience his grace. We will begin to experience his mercy. We will begin to experience his power. And without that, we will never be able to live this Christian life. Verse number 34. If you lend to those 
from whom you hope to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much again. So brothers and sisters, a gift given to someone to receive a favor isn't really a gift, isn't it? Supposing I give a gift to somebody because I want to receive something in return from that person, is it really a gift? Absolutely not. It is a bribe. It is something that I'm going to do so that I will get something from that person in return. Or possibly, you know, something even better than that what I've given. You know, Proverbs chapter 10, verse 28, and again 11, verse 7 says, there is something called as expectation. And the word expectation and hope have been used in this Proverbs in a very interchangeable manner. So hope is also expectation. When you talk about hope, hope is like I'm expecting something good to happen. Unless a person is in hope, he will never be able to expect anything in return. So doing what the world is, does to get back in return is not Christian giving. I want to repeat this. Just like the world that does something for somebody or people of this world without Christ who do something for somebody because they want to get something in return is not Christian giving at all. That is basically manipulation. Christian giving is given in agape love with no expectation or anything expected in return. This is when the miracle actually happens. You know, my brothers and sisters, many a times, People are sowing, people are giving, and even Christians have been taught that way. Unless you give, you will not be blessed. Unless you sow, you will not be reaping. And that is true to a greater extent. But remember, brothers and sisters, God is interested in our motive. God is interested, what is the motive of our giving? If our motive is only to get in return, we will give it just like the world does, and we will find ourselves frustrated when we give and we don't get it in return. But when our motive is only to give out of love, because God has put that love into my heart, when God has put that love into my spirit, now, because of that love, I'm going to give. Can you imagine? Jesus was observing people in the temple, putting their treasures, putting their money in the temple treasury. And while he was seeing the people putting all that money, some of them were putting large sums of money, he noticed a widow. Remember, she was a widow. She was not a person who had a husband, she had anybody. She had nothing to look forward to. And the word of God says she had two copper coins and she took those two copper coins and put it in the temple treasury. And Jesus observed that and he told his disciples, he says, this woman has put in more than all the others. Two copper coins would have not much value. It would have not been more than a, 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 a penny's worth. And yet Jesus saw the motive of this woman. He saw the love that she had for the Lord. He knew that those two copper coins were all that she had to live on. And that's what the word of God says. She has put in everything that she has to live on. But this was a woman who loved the Lord and she was ready to offer her life to the Lord. What did she do? She put in everything she had. The word of God does not tell us that anything good happened to her, but it is very true when Jesus said it and then honored this woman, he saw her motive. And it is very obvious that this woman would have been blessed and blessed and blessed beyond her imagination. Brothers and sisters, it is important for us to always assess our motives in our giving. It's not about what we give or how much we give. It is important to understand the motive of our giving. Verse number 34, 35. But love your enemies, do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. Your reward will be great and you will be children of the Most High. For he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Can you imagine, brothers and sisters, John chapter 1 verse 14 says that when we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, we become the children of the heavenly father. John chapter one, verse 14. I want to read that. When we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, we believe in the son of God, we become the children of the heavenly father. John 1, 14. Please read that. And the word became flesh and lived among us. 
I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It is John uh, 1 verse 12. John 1 verse 12. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become the children of God. Brothers and sisters, this is the Lord Jesus Christ. Everyone who received the Lord Jesus Christ, who believed in his word, believed in him, they became the children of the heavenly father. And you and I become children of the heavenly father when we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And today's verse 35 says, to be a child of the most high God, to be a child of the most high God, these are the following requirements. Number one, we must love our enemies. Can you imagine if you and I are going to call ourselves children of the most high God, we are going to call ourselves the children of God, we are going to be the sons and daughters of the heavenly father. The first requirement for us is today to love our enemies, to do good and lend and expect nothing back in return. Can you imagine you are going to give to somebody, you're going to lend to somebody, you're going to give to somebody and you're not going to expect it in return. Then only you are a child of the heavenly father and someone who's a child of the heavenly father is a child who will never ever be forsaken. The father is your father. The heavenly father is your father. And if you are his child, you're doing what, is, what, is, what your father expects you to do. He has promised you that he will never leave you, never forsake you. He will never abandon you. There'll be no lack in your life. Brothers and sisters, are we ready to take this, be gutsy people? Are we going to really trust the Lord and do what his word says? Are we really going to prove to our father in heaven that we are truly his sons and daughters by loving our enemies and doing good and doing, you know, lending to people and doing blessings to others, especially after discernment, expecting nothing in return. And the word of God says, the reward for doing such things is extremely great. Can you imagine, my brothers and sisters, the reward for loving our neighbors, the reward for lending those whom you'll never get in return is so great that you can never imagine nothing in this world can ever give you that reward. And God is a God who is kind, even to the evil and to the ungrateful. That's what this verse 35 says. This is exactly the opposite of fallen human beings because fallen human beings will never ever do good to those who do evil to them. They will on the contrary return evil with evil and never return anything with good. And so brothers and sisters, as believers of the Lord Jesus Christ, this God kind of love is deposited inside of us at our new birth. And it is only through the agape love displayed that unbelievers shall know the Lord Jesus Christ. Can you imagine? There are so many unbelievers today around in the world who don't know Christ. But how are they going to know Christ? By you preaching to them? By telling them that Jesus went to the cross? Absolutely not. It is only by displaying agape love, by loving our neighbors, by returning, by doing good for those who will never do good to us in return. Only those people will accept Christ and they will, re they will realize that we are followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what Jesus did in John chapter 13, verse 35. What did he say? What did Jesus say in John 13, verse 35? Let us read that. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So in order to be known as the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, it is not because we will show everybody we have a baptism certificate, that this is the church that we go on every Sunday, that we have a Bible in our hand that we read because I have a scapula in my hand and I got a rosary in my neck. No, 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 no. These are not going to be the reasons why people who are unbelievers are going to know that you belong to Christ. They will only know Christ by our love for one another. And brothers and sisters, a distinguishing quality of a true believer of the Lord Jesus Christ is that a believer, a true believer, a true disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ will operate in agape love, will operate in unconditional love, will operate in love where even you will love and forgive your enemies and you will do good to those people expecting nothing in return. Verse number 36. Be merciful just as your father is merciful. So brothers and sisters, all of us, 
Each one of us who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ are called to be merciful, just as God is merciful. This can only happen when we receive Christ and we are born anew. Only when we receive Christ and we are born anew. Because if we have not received Christ and we have not received this new birth, on our own human strength, we will never, ever be able to show mercy. We will never be able to show compassion. We will never be able to forgive those people who have hurt us. We will never be able to even love the people who have, who have hated us, who have done harm to us. But when we begin to look, keep our focus on the Lord Jesus Christ, we keep looking at him and not looking at the person who has offended us and hurt us, now, God, who has created all of us, will get involved in the battle and he'll give us the victory that we are looking for. Verse number 37. Do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Very straightforward is verse number 37. It's all talking about sowing and reaping. You know, brothers and sisters, as I mentioned to you earlier, the kingdom of God operates on the principle of sowing and reaping. And remember, sowing and reaping is not just because I sow to return, get back and return. When I sow in love, that harvest that is going to come is also going to come in love. And that's exactly what St. Paul writes to the Galatians in chapter 6, verse 7. Let us read Galatians 6, verse 7. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For you reap whatever you sow. You reap whatever you sow. So this is God's law. If we have sown the wrong seeds, we have actually allowed our emotions, our feelings, our moods, our hormones, our situation, our circumstances to allow us to, you know, spit out that venom, that poison and do all sorts of mess in our life. What we have sown is definitely going to come as a harvest. But praise God when we receive the good news, when we receive the word of God and we begin to repent and change our thinking and start operating according to the word of God. Every harvest of the old seeds is immediately cut because the word of God says in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12, the word of God is alive active, operative, sharper than a double-edged sword. So when you take the word of God, the word of God has got the ability to cut off all the harvest of unbelief, all that poisonous harvest that is coming against you because of the wrong seeds you have sown. And now the harvest of God's kingdom is going to come upon us. So brothers and sisters, it is important for us to sow the word of God. It is important for us to be doers of the word of God. And when we do the word, we are proving to God that we are with him and we are belonging to him. And now we begin to experience that harvest of God's kingdom. Verse number 38. Give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For the measure you give, will be the measure you get back. Now listen to this very carefully, brothers and sisters. This verse talks about God's law that works in the spiritual realm. Remember, in this world, in order for us to receive anything, the principle of sowing and reaping will always apply. And verse number 38 is actually giving us an understanding how God's law works in the spiritual realm. On the earth, when we live here on the earth, in order to receive anything, we open our hands and we take. Because if we want to receive anything, we will actually ask somebody. We will take and we will receive it in our hand. But in God's kingdom, it is exactly the opposite. In God's kingdom, in order to receive, we must give. And this is exactly opposite to the way the world works. Because the world will always say, take and you shall receive. But in God's kingdom, it is give and you shall receive. And brothers and sisters, it takes faith to do what God's word says. It takes faith because when you have a need, your mind will scream and say, what nonsense. You have to receive. You need the money. You need to pay the fees. You need to pay the rent. You need it for your health. You need for your insurance. You need for so much of rent to pay. And you got the need for that. And you are going out and giving that money. Absolutely foolish. But in God's kingdom, 
a person who is gutsy a person who believes god's word is not going to be ruled by those negative thoughts he is actually going to move in a contrary way because of a person operates by faith according to god's word that person is definitely going to receive a god kind of harvest remember my brothers and sisters god wants you and me to live an abundant life god wants you and me to live a full life he doesn't want us to live like beggars he doesn't want us to live with crumbs he doesn't want us to live like that samaritan woman who came and she said even the dogs eat the crumbs which fall on the master's table you and i are not people who are going to eat crumbs from the kingdom of god you and i are sons and daughters and therefore we are supposed to eat the full meal we are supposed to eat the abundant life we are supposed to live the full life and therefore brothers and sisters when we sow the seed in the ground we know that we are going to get a harvest like for example in this last 3 4 months here in this place in india because of the monsoon the farmers have gone and sown the seed and they are expecting a harvest in a couple of months if they had not sown the seed if they only had prayed and they only had thought that because they prayed they would get a harvest they would have been sadly mistaken at the time of harvest they would have only had the weeds to harvest but because they sowed the seed they know that the harvest is coming and so brothers and sisters in god's kingdom when we sow the seed one seed there is going to be a harvest of 30 60 90 100 there's going to be a lot of seed in the same way when we sow in god's kingdom with our time with our energy with our resources with our money with our talent whatever the lord has given us the lord is going to multiply that when it is done out of love god loves a cheerful giver remember my brothers and sisters you are not doing in god's kingdom in order to receive something you are doing something because the love of god has been poured into your heart and when we understand god has put that love into our hearts it is god who loved us first we can only give what we have received received and therefore when god has put his love into us and we give that love by means of our talent our money our time our energy whatever is in our hand god takes that and he multiplies it and allows us to receive a harvest and therefore brothers and sisters whenever we go and do any charity or whenever we do any giving or whenever we do any sowing in somebody's life remember it is important for us along with the gift that we are giving to always say the prayer according to Luke chapter uh, 6 verse 38 it says give and it shall be given to you press down shaken together running over for with the measure that you give is the measure with which you shall receive so brothers and sisters if for example i have got say an x amount of money and i want to sow into somebody's life which i know that person is in need and i am not going to get that money in return go there with a cheerful loving heart give that envelope to that person and make a prayer of agreement with that person and say i am sowing the seed in your life according to luke 6:38 because jesus god said give and it shall be given to you press down shaken together running over and you know brothers and sisters when i take this and make this prayer i make the prayer of faith with my giving i am actually sowing in that person's life and then i say lord just as your word says i am sowing in the life of this brother i'm sowing into life of this sister i'm sowing into the life of this particular institution i'm sowing into the life of this family and because i have sown i believe lord that this seed which i have sown is going to bring a harvest into this family into this brother into this sister that i will not be the source of their blessing but now you will be the source of their blessing and now henceforth this brother this sister this family this institution will not be looking to me to be their source but they will be looking to you as their source that now henceforth they will not be any more borrowers of money or anything but they will also be givers and lenders of the love that you have poured into them and you know brothers and sisters every time we do this in our giving we take this prayer according to verse 638 and we make that prayer of faith now you have sown that seed and been a blessing to somebody but because you are sown in love that harvest of what you have sown is coming back to you not only in your money it's coming in back to you in your family in your marriage in your relationship in your finances in your health i tell you my brothers and sisters i have experienced myself the power of luke 638 uh, n number of times in my life 
even when I had difficulty, but the Lord who's always been faithful has shown me that his glory is only when we put our faith in his word, when we put our trust in him, not looking at our situation, but depending on him to give us that abundant harvest, which he alone can give us. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you and we praise you for this wonderful word and you have given us and explaining to us today through the, through the scriptures. Father God, you are the God who loves us so much. You have shown us, Lord, that when we are in your kingdom, there is a way how people in your kingdom live. There is a way that people in your kingdom have got a characteristic. And this verses that we have reflected today have shown us how as followers of you, Lord Jesus, we should live and how we can experience that victorious life. Today, as we heard the word, help us, Lord, not only to hear the word, but to go out and be doers of the word, to put into practice what we have heard and to receive the victorious life that Jesus won for us. We praise you and we thank you, Father, for all this in the glorious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen, my brothers and sisters.